Good morning. This is Ed Rudiger, and I am delighted you're tuning in to hear the sermon I'm going to be preaching this morning in Mingo Junction. Uh, it's based on a passage from the Gospel of Mark, the 8th chapter, beginning with the 31st verse. So hear the Word of God as written by the evangelist Mark. Jesus began telling his disciples what would happen to him. He said the nation's leaders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law of Moses will make the Son of Man suffer terribly. He will be rejected and killed, but three days later he will rise to life. Then Jesus explained clearly what he meant. Peter took Jesus aside and told him to stop talking like that. But when Jesus turned and saw the disciples, he corrected Peter. He said to him, Satan, get away from me. You are thinking like everyone else and not like God. Jesus then told the crowd and the disciples to come closer, and he said, If any of you want to be my followers, you must forget about yourself. You must take up your cross and follow me. If you want to save your life, you will destroy it. But if you give up your life for me and the good news, you will save it. What will you gain if you own the whole world but destroy yourself? What could you give, give to get back your soul? Don't be ashamed of me and my message among these unfaithful and sinful people. If you are, the Son of Man will be ashamed of you when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Amen. Praise God for this reading from his word. Now, if you watch WTOV Channel 9 News, you may know what I'm talking about with the title of the sermon this morning. But if you don't, let me explain a couple of years ago, WTOV bought this really sophisticated and I assume expensive drone called the Skyview 9. Of course, when you first see it, man, it looks like something out of a science fiction movie with propellers attached to four legs extending from a central body with a, with a camera coming out of the bottom. I'll tell you, 20 years ago, it would have been the stuff of nightmares, but not now. In fact, according to their press release, this is just another example of how WTOV9 is always working to give you the best view of every story. And I'll tell you, I believe it really does what it's supposed to do. I mean, where in the past a camera on a tower could give just one perspective, the Skyview 9 can go, man, it can go anywhere. And even though it's sort of like those helicopters I remember, you know, the ones that radio stations used when I was a kid to give a, give a broader view of the traffic going in and out of the naval base, this drone is nearly silent. And not only can it hover, it can move and zoom so that we really can get the, the best view of every story, something we might miss if everything is on the same level. You see, it really is an eye in the sky. And I'll tell you, that's kind of what the evangelist Mark was doing for us when he wrote his gospel. I mean, in a very real sense, he was serving as an eye in the sky as he wrote about the good news of Jesus. Because he offered all kinds of stuff we wouldn't have known if we'd actually been in the story. For example, right at the beginning, he told us what he was describing. This is the good news about Jesus, Christ, the Son of God. And at the baptism, man, we heard the voice from heaven, even though it was directed at Jesus. You are my own dear son, and I am pleased with you. And before we cast him out, we heard the demon say again, words that were directed, directed at Jesus. Jesus from Nazareth, what do you want from us? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are God's holy one. And we know that after he cured the man with a withered hand on the Sabbath, the Pharisees left and right away they started making plans with Herod's followers to kill Jesus. You see, the evangelist told us stuff that not even the disciples knew. In other words, he gave us the best view of every story. And in that way, for us, his gospel really is our eye in the sky. And I'll tell you, we're going to take advantage of that perspective this morning. You see, as we consider the first time Jesus taught about what he was about to face, and the first time he had to confront one of his closest followers, and the first time he described in detail what following was all about, as we do that, we're going to sort of look down at what happened 
And then we're going to take what we see and apply it to ourselves. And you know, I think doing that will help us recognize three things we might miss if we actually put ourselves in the story. For example, when we assume this broader perspective, I think we're going to be able to understand that Jesus really did need to suffer. And that's certainly in the passage we read. Jesus began telling his disciples what would happen to him. He said, the nation's leaders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law of Moses will make the Son of Man suffer terribly. He will be rejected and killed, but three days later he will rise to life. Then Jesus explained clearly what he meant. Now, that's what Mark wrote. And since we're familiar with the rest of the story, we know that's exactly what happened. I mean, we know that soon after he gets to Jerusalem, his support is going to melt away. Man, even the crowds that followed him around and scared the Pharisees so much they decided to bide their time, they're going to be yelling for his crucifixion in just a little while. As a matter of fact, when he gets to the end, and I'm talking about the end of both his ministry and his life, he's really only going to have 12 followers left. And of those, one will betray him, one will deny him, And the rest will, man, they're going to run away. Yeah, he was right about being rejected. And he was sure going to suffer and be killed. As Mark will write, and I think I read these verses last week. About noon, the sky turned dark and stayed that way until about around three o'clock. And then about that time, Jesus shouted, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you deserted me? Some of the people standing there heard Jesus and said, he's calling for Elijah. One of them ran and grabbed a sponge. After he had soaked it in wine, he put it on a stick and held it up to Jesus. He said, let's wait and see if Elijah will come and take him down. Jesus shouted and then died. And so he was right about suffering and death too. But of course, we already know that's not the end of the story. As the young man said to the women who entered the empty tomb, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus from Nazareth who was nailed to a cross. God has raised him to life and he isn't here. You see the place where they put his body. And so we know that Jesus was spot on when he described his future. But more than just knowing, thanks to our broader perspective, we can also understand why this had to happen. You see, because he was rejected, we can appreciate the fact that the gospel is all about what's true, not necessarily what's easy or comfortable or popular. And because he suffered and died, we have a Savior who knows what we're feeling on our very worst day, and who actually experienced separation and abandonment and even death, something we might and will experience sometime in our lifetime. But since that's not the end of Jesus' story, I mean, since we know that there's an empty tomb there in the shadow in the cross, and there's a resurrection right after the crucifixion, we can be confident that death won't end our story either. You see, Jesus really did need to suffer, something we can understand when we look down on this story. And that's one. And second, when we approach these verses from a broader perspective— I think we can also see pretty clearly something we should really avoid. And I'm talking about the temptation to assume that we can define who Jesus is and why he came and what he expects from us. And I believe that's a trap Peter fell into according to the passage we just read. After Jesus had talked about what he was going to endure, Mark wrote, Peter took Jesus aside and told him to stop talking like that. But when Jesus turned and saw the disciples, he corrected Peter. He said to him, Satan, get away from me. You are thinking like everyone else and not like God. Now that's what Mark said. And I'll tell you what Peter assumed and did. Man, I believe it really does reflect the way most people think. I mean, I think folks have a tendency to assume that what they know best and what they believe to be right is right because they believe it. For example... A couple of days ago, I was talking with a guy who's throwing out, oh, a whole bunch of opinions that he said were all facts. And when I asked him to send me any articles he had that supported what he was claiming, he said, well, I guess we just have different facts. I'm telling you, 
An opinion or an assumption or feeling doesn't become a fact just because we want it to be. But that seems to be a way a lot of people think nowadays. Just like they seem to assume that they have the right to reshape the words of Jesus and the message of the Bible to fit what they want to believe. Even if that means yanking stuff out of context and focusing on just a few verses while ignoring the vast majority of Scripture. And why do they do it? I think it's so that they can follow with Christ who confirms rather than confronts what they already believe. And that sure seems to be what a lot of folks feel comfortable doing, even to the point of condemning those who don't. But as we look down on this story, isn't that what Peter did to Jesus? And he did it the minute the one he had just called the Christ started to say some things that made him uncomfortable. And isn't that why Jesus called Peter Satan? Because he was trying to distract Jesus from doing what he knew he had to do. And that's the same thing Satan tried to do, do in the wilderness. And isn't that why Jesus told his number one disciple to stop trying to lead and get back to where he was supposed to be? And I'm talking about behind the one who called him to follow. Sure it is. And I'll tell you, I think that can be applied in our world just like it did in his. Therefore, it just makes sense for us to focus our attention on what Jesus actually said rather than on what we might, might have wanted him to say and to make the radical decision to use our two ears more than our one mouth and to recognize that Jesus came to save us, not the other way around. You see, we really should avoid following the example of Peter. The second thing I think we can see when we sort of look down on this story. And third, right along with something we can understand and something we should avoid, I believe a broader perspective can really help us accept that following Jesus is challenging, if not out and out tough. Again, listen to how Jesus described the life he was challenging Peter and the, uh, his other followers to live. Jesus then told the crowd and the disciples to come closer. He said, and if any of you want to be my followers, you must forget about yourself. You must take up your cross and follow me. If you want to save your life, you will destroy it. And if you give up your life for me and for the good news, you will save it. Now, <clears throat> I don't know about y'all, but for me, this seems every bit as clear as it is uncomfortable. For example, if I'm serious about following Jesus, I'd better get ready to deny myself, which may include denying my desires, and denying my opinions and denying my own self-righteousness. And then I need to be willing to take up the cross, which not only points to definite pain, but also to humiliation, because there's nothing more humiliating than hearing the jeers and ridicule as you carry a cross down the street. And I'll tell you, that's probably what's going to happen when I make the decision to listen rather than to talk and to learn rather than to assume. You see, that's how we follow Jesus. And why is it important? Why is it important to deny and to carry and to follow? Again, listen to Mark. If you want to save your life, you will destroy it. But if you give up your life for me and for the good news, you will save it. What will you gain if you own the whole world but destroy yourself? What could you give to get back your soul? Don't be ashamed of me and my message among these unfaithful and sinful people. If you are, the Son of Man will be ashamed of you when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. I guess you could say that what we choose to do carries consequences. And I'll tell you that's something we probably should accept as we consider this passage. Now, I've got to admit, I really like WTOV's Sky View 9. Watching something unfold from above is just more interesting and informative than seeing everything from ground level. And you know, maybe that's why the evangelist Mark offered us a different perspective as he told about the good news of Jesus, the Christ and the Son of God. For example, take the passage we considered this morning, the one in which Jesus talked about himself and confronted Peter and told the disciples what following was all about. You see, by considering these verses... We can understand that Jesus had to suffer, and we can avoid thinking like everyone else, and we can accept that following Jesus is going to be challenging. 
Now, I believe this is what we'll be able to see when we claim the Gospel of Mark as our own eye in the sky. Amen. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it helpful and uh, meaningful. And until I talk with you again, I want you to remember you are a child of God and God loves you very much. Goodbye until next time.